is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lockwood. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Positive economic data from China propel global stocks to their first weekly gain in a month. But U.S. futures drop as more Fed officials take a hawkish stance on rates. The FCA launches an investigation into the London Metal Exchange's handling of a short squeeze in the nickel market last year when futures spiked 250% in a little over 24 hours. Plus, China's central bank governor signals monetary policy will remain stable this year with the National People's Congress set to begin on Sunday. Now, U.S. data yesterday highlighted a tight job market that's contributing, of course, to inflationary pressures. Investors watching the weekly jobless claims data closely for any sign that the labor market is starting to crack. Now, for more on all of this, let's get straight to our Bloomberg Markets reporter, Valerie Titel. Uh, Valerie, good morning. So break down the numbers for us. Yet again, jobless claims continue to surprise. In 13 out of the 14 weeks, they have come below estimates. You can see that here, uh, the, the, that white bar coming in below the blue line, meaning that it's come below estimates. There was also some other concerning signs uh, in the labor market data yesterday, Francine, one of which was that unit labor costs, a measure of wage inflation, was revised up. And that came alongside uh, labor productivity being revised down. Those are some worrying signs for the Fed. That's surely something they don't want to see. We're getting some breaking news, Larry, out of those uh, PMI. So we have, it's like drip, drip, drip. We have Germany. We had uh, some of the other ones. And finally, we have the Eurozone aggregate PMI. And it's coming in a slight below what we were expecting at 52.7 instead of the 53. So it's not huge. But, Valerie, there does seem, whether you look at ECB or you look at Fed, there just seems to be a, a realization that actually as long as the economy stays strong, then, you know, hikes have to get much stronger. We heard that uh, from Mr. Waller yesterday. Yeah, it's, that's right, Francine. It seems like whether it's the ECB or the Fed, we have had a, an incremental step up in hawkish language. Fed Waller spoke yesterday. He, he released some texts online. And what he said to me that stood out is that he needs to see CPI pull back significantly. He's implying the next CPI print, which we get in the Fed's blackout period that comes on March 14th. If that doesn't pull back significantly, the terminal rate, his terminal rate in that dot plot is going to head higher. That was clearly some hawkish language out of Fed's Waller. He is a influential member at the Fed, so be sure to note anything he says. Thank you so much, Valerie Titel. I mean, what happened to him was also a little bit crazy. So we had prepared remarks from him. He was going to give the speech, but then someone mistakenly put porn on the website or on the speakerphone. I mean, it doesn't happen every day, Valerie. It doesn't happen. It does not. It was quite something. Our Valerie Titel there with the very latest on some of the markets. Now, let's bring in Ben Guttridge, Director of Model Portfolio Services at Invesco. I mean, thank goodness we have those prepared remarks for, for Mr. Waller because he was not able to, to actually deliver his speech and he's certainly not able to do Q&A. Do you, um, Ben, ha have a different view after the week where, you know, governing council after governing council on the ECB board where you have two, three Fed officials saying, look, you know, interest rate hikes will have to go higher? Um... Well, I would, I would agree that interest rates will be, will be heading higher. I don't think that's too controversial. And, you know, it's causing some disquiet in markets. But uh, I wouldn't discount the disinflationary forces that are sort of still in markets. Really? Yes, yes. Still cling, <laughs> cling to it, cling to it. Who is this rogue? Yeah, but no, I, I think there is... You know, uh, it could be, well, it's likely to be a difficult period, but come the no. summer, there could be a more a growing chorus of voices about, you know, pausing rates right. and, uh, you know, maybe that the, the next move would be, yeah. would be lower. Not, not at the okay. summertime, but later, yeah. in, later in the year. But, but so the, the concern, I think, is that you can go from, like, 9% inflation to 7 maybe to 6 What happens to go from, like, 5% inflation to 2% if that's really their target? Yeah, I know. I think the... The, uh, I think this, the suggestion is that you sort of need a recession, really. You need to get that uh, labour market weakness yeah, to, to deliver... Economy, yeah, yeah, right? to, to deliver that 2% yeah. target. But, look, I think, like, between here and there, if inflationary trends are sort of heading towards target but not hitting target, then the Federal Reserve can sort of take a pause on uh, being quite so aggressive with policy. And, you know, given the sort of bearish consensus, you know, that yeah. could offer some right. relief to markets. Of course, you know, when the... Re you know, when the recession comes, you know, that's not necessarily going to be a good period for markets. But just talking relative to expectations, you know, a, a softening pace of policy execution uh, could offer relief to markets. So you're not buying bonds. You think this is, I don't know whether there's anything that's being mispriced at the moment or it's just now, you know, we're at peak. Uh, well, 
like this sort of a portfolio construction element here. I think if we want to run our equity position, then we are vulnerable to like growth disappointments. And uh, if the Fed does move a bit more aggressively, uh, then I think whilst the short end would, would rise, uh, battling that inflation, then growth concerns I think do materialise. And maybe longer bonds could be something more of a hedge in still in an inflationary environment or you know where the fed are talking more hawkishly so it does does bring about as i say more troubling growth outcomes into the future um ben talk to me a little bit about the earnings season so th they've you know pretty much held up there were a lot of share buybacks and dividends are, are we sowing the seeds of the next crisis because we're not going to be investing enough no i don't uh i i wouldn't necessarily sort of buy buy into that i think Corporate uh, balance sheets have, uh, are generally in, in pretty good health. I think in certain sectors, uh, you know, you sort of, you know, airlines, perhaps in miners and things like that, you're starting to see um, capex intentions uh, tick up. I wouldn't necessarily say we're in uh, talking about ill discipline uh, qu quite yet. So, no, I think like the, the, the major concerns for me isn't sort of management execution. It would still be this sort of generally inflationary picture right. and, uh, and how central banks react it would sort of continue to drive mar our market view, I think. Are you not surprised that the consumer keeps on spending? Um, not from the what I see in my own household, <laughs> no. But, but uh, is that a COVID <laughs> overhang? I mean, I'm trying, like, we have these models, and I understand that the models, you know, work in grand part. But it's just when, when inflation's so high, your income's going down, it's pretty incredible to see, so, you know, such consumer resilience. Yeah, well, I think um, there is a couple of parts. That. There is sort of quite a high, uh, through, through the pandemic period, yeah. savings rate went up either through right. checks or through uh, restricted spending. And, and here we are in an environment, actually, where, you know, the labour force might have a little bit more confidence because, um, you, know, the, the, you know, I don't think employers... Like are quite so ready. There's a few areas like in tech and things like that where where there's sort of layoffs and a little bit in, in, in financial services. But generally, the labour market's in pretty good good uh, good shape. So consumers uh, feeling confident in their jobs, coupled with reasonably high levels of savings, certainly in the middle and higher income portions of society. You know that can continue to sort of drive a robust consumption story. All right, Ben. Thank you so much for all of the insight. Ben Guttridge, there, director of Model Portfolio Service at Invesco. Coming up, we'll be joined by Veolia Chief Executive Estelle Brack enough to talk earnings and the outlook at one of the world's biggest water services companies. That exclusive interview is next and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, this week, the French utility Veolia reported a jump in annual earnings and pledged to increase its dividend by 12%. The water and waste management giant, which bought half of rival Suez last year, benefited from drought in Europe and more stringent green policies across the world. Now, that's seen rising demand for Veolia services, which include decarbonization, hazardous waste processing and plastic recycling. Well, we are delighted to be joined here in the studio by the Veolia Chief Executive Estelle Braklianov. Thank you so much for joining us. First of all, congratulations on a very strong set of results you're giving back to shareholders. Is there pressure in general to actually give back to shareholders, either through buybacks or dividends, to make sure that, that they stick with you? No, I, I actually, uh, as a company, we have to give back to, obviously, shareholders and the company in investing for the future mm -hmm. of the company. And we have many projects in Veolia and to the uh, employees as well. And we have the right balance, I think. But you, you're right to mention it was really a history cure for Veolia, you know, in terms of results mm -hmm. uh, and history cure because of the merger with, uh, with Suez, mm -hmm. uh, which has been uh, delivered in a very... Uh, record and super successful year because it's just been a one year record results uh, 43 yes. billion euro uh, turnover which is yeah. a plus 50 percent compared to a year ago uh, or 14 percent you know at a constant exchange yeah. rate and scope down to 30 percent of net results so very happy. So not bad. Yes. So when you look at, I guess, the next two, three, four years, the world is becoming much more conscious about how we use waste, how we deal with hazardous products. Where do you see the main growth for Veolia? So how will your company change as the world has a better conscience? Um, I guess there is a, a perfect, um, a specific momentum 
uh, for unbundled services in the world and for a company like us to benefit from it. You know, it's a, it's a, a 2,500 billion market, super fast growing, as you can imagine. Uh, and uh, the populations are asking now that we talk to them about solutions, not about the realization moment. They, but they want yeah. that we act and speed yeah. up. And uh, we're here for that. We're here to help our customer, be they city or industries, yeah. to decarbonize, to depollute or to regenerate resources. Who's doing it right? So you pitch for contracts, of course, from governments or more at the local level. Uh, we have in, of course, the US, the Inflation Reduction Act. Like, if you look at the regions, who will be in a much better place in five, ten years? No, I, I guess, you know, the push is pretty much everywhere now. Okay. Uh, in the US, in Europe, in Australia, in the okay. Middle East even, uh, you know, and in Asia, everywhere we see push for more environmental solution, depollution, decarbonization. Uh, and we are uniquely placed, a uh, leader worldwide, but in the top three in the US, uh, in Europe, uh, number one in Australia. Uh, so we really, uh, I think, are the largest decarbonizing company. Mm -hmm. We've helped our customers save 14 million tons of carbon that's alone in 2022, which is amazing. It is pretty amazing. When you look at inflation, the inflationary pressure is what it means for interest rates, but also government spending. Is, is this one of your biggest concerns? Oh, it's not a concern because we really are protected uh, mm -hmm. against uh, inflation, as we've seen in our result for 2022. A very resilient model, but adaptive uh, as mm -hmm. well, uh, because we are very international. Uh, and, you know, the mechanism of, you know, automatic indexation formula helps us a lot. Is there something that you wish you could do better? So I don't know whether it's a piece of technology that you hope you would have that will actually transform, uh, you know, the, the way we do some of these things at, at a cheaper level. Or I know there's been, a, for example, a big scandal in the UK about the way you process water and some of the holes there to try and keep the water. Like, what do we need to do better? I guess it's not about, you know, the solutions, a lot of them are existing and we already have a lot of technologies. So now it's time to scale up and to speed up their deployment across the globe. Uh, and a company like Veolia is helping that. In, uh, you're talking about water scarcity, which yes. is a big thing. Mm -hmm. Reuse of wastewater is a solution we can develop more and more in the UK, like in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. Decarbonization, use waste and wastewater as an alternative fuel, as opposed to importing fossil fuel, is another solution we can deploy yeah. more and more. But this is something that, that's coming in and that's real. I know we also talk about you know, fusion. How far away are we from, for example, having waste as fuel as something that makes a significant amount of the energy we consume? We already have the technology. We already have the industrial you know, capabilities. Now the scaling up is about having all the legislation uh, aligning and speeding up the authorization and planning and, uh, and process. So I guess... Uh, this is not the technology which is missing. At times, it's more the speeding up of all the administrative element of it. Are there any components that actually, because of the supply chain disruption, you're missing to be able to scale up some of these technologies? Actually, we're innovating and uh, a lot in the lithium recovery, just okay. to give an example. Yeah. Uh, and actually, uh, we have put a lot of energy in R&D to be able uh, to scale up our capability to recycle electric car batteries because in the electric car batteries you have lithium cobalt and nickel yeah. which are very scarce uh, and actually we think we can mine those to actually extract the metals to yeah. be able to go back into the loops of production I, I think elon musk two days ago was saying that actually he can live without earth rare earths he's trying to do these batteries do you think that's the is that a possible future or is it just too far away Oh, I guess, you know, like, maybe he will be able to do that. But in the meantime, we probably have 5, 10, 15 years where we will need a lot of those rare metals to actually yeah. provide, you know, uh, cell phone batteries yeah. and electric car batteries. So instead of waiting for a new solution, what about deploying what we have today and speeding up? And, and speeding that up. Um, so talk to me just a little bit about France specifically. So there has been a drought problem and, of course, concerns about water leakages. So what would you implement today to make sure that that stops going forward? Actually, two things. You're right. You know, France discovered that, you know, uh, water was a such a rare resource that actually you couldn't, you know, just waste it or just use it once. And we have two things uh, we can implement quickly. One is to improve uh, the yield distribution network of water distribution because there is still one litre out of five in France which is 
waste is in the distribution. Mm. Actually, it's even worse in the UK, if I may. Yeah. And actually, and we have a lot of yeah. technologies to detect the leaks before yeah. they happen. And you can imagine yeah. it saves a lot of water. And the second thing is to reuse wastewater, of course, yeah. treated wastewater, yeah. uh, to come back into, you know, helping the agriculture sector or uh, the industries uh, to use water which is reused instead of, you know, uh, yeah. taking it from uh, the natural resource. Those two solutions will help up, say, five to ten yeah. years uh, very, very likely. But we can have the same in the UK. And actually, we've developed these technologies in Spain a lot. Okay. Uh, so we, we have the ability to do better now. Estelle, thank you so much for joining us today. That was Estelle Braklianov, the Veolia Chief Executive, on a great conversation. I hope this is just one of many interviews here in the studio with the Veolia Chief Executive. Coming up, the UK Markets Watchdog is launching an investigation into the London Metal Exchange on the halt to nickel trading a year ago. We have the details next, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo says the administration is working to blunt the national security risk from various Chinese social media apps. In an interview with Bloomberg, Raimondo said the rules would apply to high-profile targets like TikTok as well as other Chinese platforms. So if what we're worried about is Chinese-backed companies being on, you know, tens of millions of American phones, including members of the military, and privacy concerns, data concerns, misinformation concerns, that doesn't just apply to TikTok. Now, Bloomberg has learned that Foxconn plans to invest about $700 million on a new plant in India to ramp up local production. The Taiwanese company, one of Apple's biggest suppliers, plans to make iPhone parts and possibly assemble handsets on the 300-acre site close to the airport in Bengaluru. The new plant could employ about 100,000 people. Bloomberg has learned that Blackstone has defaulted on a $531 million euro bond backed by a portfolio of Finnish commercial property. Bondholders are said to have rejected the firm's request for another extension to dispose of the assets. The default comes as rising interest rates hit European property values. Blackstone says it continues to have full confidence in the wider portfolio and its management team. The US is warning companies against doing business with those trying to evade sanctions on Russia. The Commerce Department says Companies should watch for points where goods are legally purchased but then sent on to Russia or Belarus. Those locations include China, Macau and countries close to Russia such as Turkey and Armenia. China's workforce has shrunk by more than 40 million people in the past three years. The drop since 2019 is equivalent to almost the entire workforce of Germany and reflects a rapid rise in the number of people retiring as well as the effect of the pandemic. Official data showed some 733 million people were employed in China last year. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans and this is Bloomberg Francine. Thank you so much, Leanne. Now, the UK's market watchdog, FCA, has opened an investigation into the London Metal Exchange over its handling of a controversial short squeeze in the nickel market last year. Well, for more, let's bring Bloomberg's Jonathan Browning. Uh, Jonathan, was it exactly what do we know so far? And if you think about it, I mean, this we remember like it was yesterday because it was such high stakes and nickel was falling and they had to shut it down and hedge funds were saying they cancelled my trades. But why has the investigation taken a, such a long time to put in place? So at 7 a.m. Uh, this morning, the FCA announced that they were going to essentially up the ante. Um, they've had a um, monitoring and uh, review of the London Metal Exchange uh, since um, the problems in the nickel market first uh, came out in March last year. This is now a step up. This is an enforcement action. Uh, and the FCA has said they're going to be looking at the LME's conduct 
and systems and controls. So what does that mean going forward, Jonathan? Is there a worry that this could happen again? Is this why they're investigating it? Um, I mean, I think the first, the first thing to say is actually that this is unprecedented. This is the very first announced enforcement action the FCA has ever conducted against an exchange. Uh, so it suggests um, a pretty uh, serious concern. Um, the FCA opens an enforcement investigation when they have reason to believe serious misconduct may have taken place. Right. And so this will be um, their review of that. And that's in, a, in, in, in also in addition to um, the Bank of England also um, saying separately that the LME's clearinghouse uh, must also strengthen governance um, and improve its risk management. Thank you so much, Jonathan Bramling there with the latest on the FCA probe into the LME nickel trading halt. Now, we'll be covering all things UK every week on Thursdays at 9.30 a.m. in our half an hour special. Coming up, we talk to the OECD Secretary General. Positive economic data from China propelled global stocks to their first weekly gain in a month. But U.S. futures drop as more Fed officials take a hawkish stance on rates. The FCA launches an investigation into the London Metal Exchange's handling of a short squeeze in the nickel market last year when futures spiked to 250 percent in a little over 24 hours. Plus, China's central bank governor signals monetary policy will remain stable this year with the National People's Congress set to begin on Sunday. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, and the Russian Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov, have met for the first time since Moscow invaded Ukraine last year. The two top diplomats briefly spoke on the sidelines of the G20 summit in India. Now, for more on all of this, let's bring in Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo, who's in Brussels, who had just come back also from Kiev. Maria, a brief but rare encounter between Lavrov and Blinken. So what do we know? Uh, very rare, Francine. This meeting between uh, Blinken and uh, Sergei Lavrov, they had not really spoken since the war started. This relationship, uh, for obvious reasons, has gone cold. Yesterday, we should note, it was brief. Yes, it was an informal meeting. It happened at the G20 that is going on with uh, foreign ministers in India. It was brief. If you look at the uh, readout from the United States, the message conveyed by the American diplomacy is that Russia needs to return to a diplomatic solution on Ukraine, but also, and this is important to re-engage on the START uh, nuclear disarmament program. Remember, Vladimir Putin had suspended that uh, a week ago. When you look at the Russian, however, readout of this, they said the meeting was not very interesting. The other thing that we should note is that, once again, there's no communique at the end of this G20 meeting. Foreign ministers, again, were not able to strike a compromise over the language of the war around Ukraine. This is the second time it happens. Remember, finance ministers were not able to get to a communique, neither. They point the finger to China and Russia and for Western diplomacy, this is problematic, Francine, because it is a step back from the language that they had agreed a year ago when they called the war a war. Yeah, absolutely. Maria, thank you so much for all of the terrific briefing there on the ground. Maria Tadeo in Brussels. Now, let's continue the conversation on Ukraine. The OECD Secretary General, Matthias Korman, has just returned from his trip to Kyiv as well. The OECD's council last year decided to recognize Ukraine as a prospective member country, an important step to the country looking to further integrate with the West. Well, joining us now is the OECD Secretary General, Matthias Korman. Thank you, Secretary General, for joining us. Talk to me about the reconstruction of Ukraine. Do you have any insights right now on the timeline of that would take, on the money that would take, or is it just too soon? Well, no, the reconstruction is happening right now. I mean, on my visit uh, to Kiev, I had the opportunity uh, to visit uh, Irpin, which, uh, of course, uh, was uh, a location where Russian uh, forces uh, attacked uh, and destroyed a, a bridge, uh, destroyed um, much of the uh, civil uh, infrastructure, water, energy, and other. Uh, and, uh, you know, what I was able to see was uh, a completely a new bridge uh, that was just about completed. All of the water and energy uh, infrastructure replaced and fully functional. So, I mean, what is very important to understand uh, is that uh, reconstruction, uh, yes, I mean, of course, uh, significant reconstruction uh, will be required 
after the war, but reconstruction, recovery and reform uh, are happening uh, in Ukraine yeah. right now as we speak. And, and the government and the people of Ukraine are not waiting uh, for the end of hostilities uh, to continue to uh, improve uh, their country, to rebuild and, and to look forward. Of course, but a lot of actually world leaders um, are also trying to put in place some kind of framework to, of course, disperse money. This is certainly the case of the European Union, also with accession to the member uh, countries with a list of things that Ukraine needs to do to make sure that they are part uh, of the club. A lot of this will also be on how they manage, for example, graft or how they manage um, some of the corruption concerns. What have you seen on the ground? Uh, well, look, I mean, f firstly, the people of Ukraine have really uh, impressed and inspired the world with their courage, uh, their strength, their resilience uh, in the face of this unprovoked, unjustifiable and illegal war of aggression uh, pursued against them by Russia. Now, uh, despite this, uh, I mean, and prior to the war getting underway, the government in Ukraine was alre already very much on the right path, pursuing reforms, pursuing efforts to modernize, uh, including uh, making sure that they've got uh, the institutional arrangements in place, uh, for example, uh, to tackle uh, corruption. Now, uh, while I was there this week, uh, the uh, government of Ukraine um, handed me uh, a letter uh, accepting our invitation for Ukraine to become part of the OECD uh, working group on bribery in international business transactions, for example, as a participant, uh, which is uh, uh, an important step uh, towards full membership and an important step uh, towards making sure that uh, all of the legislation, policies and practices uh, in Ukraine uh, are uh, consistent uh, with the standards that are expected of a prospective yep. member of the OECD. So the important point here again, so this is another area where uh, Ukraine is not waiting for the end of the war. Ukraine is taking steps now to reform and to modernize. So, um, Mr. Corman, there has also been under closed doors talk about seizing further Russian assets to help with the rebuilding of Ukraine. Where do you stand on this? Uh, well, you know, clearly um, Russia uh, has uh, caused this war. This is a war that Russia has started. Russia is causing uh, significant damage and harm. Um, I mean, the uh, lives lost, the uh, houses and infrastructure destroyed. I mean, it's, it's just devastating uh, to see what, what is happening there. And, you know, whoever causes harm uh, must repair that harm. And, you know, clearly, I mean, that, that, is, that is a very uh, important uh, principle. I mean, but this, this is, you know, obviously something that will have to be worked through by the international community uh, through the appropriate fora on how that is best and most appropriately done. But as a principle, uh, of course, uh, you know, Russia should be held to account and should ultimately have yeah. to pay uh, for uh, the damage that they have been causing. Yeah, so do you think we should, do you support a seizure, for example, of Russian central bank assets to help pay for the Ukraine reconstruction specifically? Well, look, I, I, I'm not going to go into uh, the specific measures. I mean, clearly sanctions have been in place and continue to evolve uh, for some uh, time now. I mean, the principal position uh, is that um, Russia ultimately uh, will have to pay reparations for the, the harm and the damage that they have done and to help with the reconstruction effort, to help finance uh, the reconstruction effort. Uh, the, specific, the specific ways in which uh, that is appropriately done uh, is something that the international community has to work through together, uh, of course, uh, with uh, uh, Ukraine. Uh, and uh, you know, that, I'm confident that that will uh, continue yeah. to be progressed. Uh, Mr. Corman, we also need to talk a little bit about inflation, but also this global uh, tax deal that has been blocked, essentially, with the U.S. and Europe really clashing quite significantly over the OECD deal. Where do you see this going forward? Can the EU go at it alone? Well, I, I don't agree with your characterization there, I've, I've got to say. So, um, you know, we uh, remain quietly optimistic that our uh, proposed reform, which was ag agreed by about 140 countries and jurisdictions around the world uh, in October uh, 21. We were quietly confident uh, that uh, that will uh, continue to be implemented to make our international tax arrangements fairer and work better in a digitalized and globalized world economy. Pillar two, the global minimum tax is essentially in place now. I mean, the 27 uh, countries across the European Union have agreed to legislate. There are many other countries around the world who are legislating. Uh, the 
United States uh, has themselves uh, a, a version of a global minimum tax already legislated through yeah. its so-called guilty regime. And, and we have recently provided guidance that uh, ensures uh, the appropriate um, interaction and compatibility between uh, the OECD global minimum tax arrangements and the, and the guilty arrangements in the United right. States. So, um, and in relation to Pillar 2, the reallocation of taxing rights, yes, I mean, there yeah. are intensive uh, discussions underway, but we, we, yeah. we are working towards the necessary compromise to uh, achieve a multilateral convention uh, document uh, in the middle of this year. So, so when do you think, so by the middle of this year, we'll actually have a deal, and you, you're right, actually it wasn't my characterization, it's the French, and especially the French right. finance minister that said, look, this global deal will be right. blocked. You're confident, well, when will we get it? Uh, no, well, I've, 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 seen, I, I've, seen what, well, I've seen what my good friend uh, and a colleague, uh, Bruno Le Maire, uh, has said, and, and I don't think that he quite put it the way you put it. But nevertheless, um, so there are two components to this deal. There is the reallocation of taxing rights under uh, Pillar 1, and it is true that this will require uh, some uh, more discussions and some more uh, compromising, but, but you know, I'm, I'm quietly confident that we will get there by the middle of this year. And in relation to Pillar 2, the global minimum tax, I mean, that is essentially now in place. Um, and so, you know, from, from where I sit, we continue uh, to progress in an orderly fashion. And, uh, you know, I think that the world needs us to be all ultimately successful here, uh, because in the absence of a, a, an agreed and implemented uh, multilateral agreement on this, we will continue to see a proliferation of unilateral measures uh, which will put pressure on our international trading system at a time when, quite frankly, uh, we don't need any more pressure on the global economy uh, that is uh, caused by a lack of international cooperation. Yeah. Well, that's very encouraging news. Thank you so much for your time today. The OECD Secretary General, Matthias Corman. Now, coming up with Citigroup saying to be the latest bank, uh, cutting jobs will focus on the state of the global labor markets. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, Bloomberg has learned that City is to cut 1% of its workforce, with those in the investment banking division amongst those affected. Now, the cuts are said to be part of normal business planning. They come just weeks after rival J.P. Morgan cut hundreds of mortgage employees. Now, let's discuss the current state of the labor market with senior euro area economist for Bloomberg Economics, David Powell, and, of course, a Bloomberg Economics editor, uh, Zoe Schneeweiss. We have, we're excited, first of all, doing this panel and bringing you both together. We're looking at labor economics and we're definitely looking at inflation data. First of all, David, and we've established that David Powell is not related to Jay Powell, which the newsroom was very happy that we put a stop yeah. to that rumor. European companies have really recently revealed a, you know, a string of job cuts, but it doesn't mean that the dynamics of the labor market are changing in any way. Well, we are, it is changing a bit. There are signs and in several indicators in the euro area, uh, as well as in the UK, that, the, uh, that some of the steam is being taken out of the labor market. So, for example, in the, in the UK, the number of vacancies, open jobs, is trending downward. Um, and that's probably also uh, peaked in the euro area as well. Um, so, while the labor markets are very strong in both places, unemployment yeah. is close to a 40-year low, there are some signs that monetary policy tightening is having an effect. Okay, so talk about monetary um, tightening. At the same time, so, and we talk about inflation day in, day out, and really we talk about the path of interest rates, but we need to understand what inflation does next. Lagarde has telegraphed it like a million and ten times, 50 basis points in March. Yes, 50 basis po points in March, so less than two weeks away, looks completely baked in now. They had already said very clearly in February that they intend to do this. So now that there's no question the data this week just confirmed that. The question really now is what happens in May. Markets are now almost pricing um, 50 basis points in May, and several policymakers have suggested they want that as well. We know that Joachim Nagel is a hawk still. He's gone out quite clearly and indicated this. Yeah. And it, if, if numbers stay this strong, it'll be difficult to make a case to go slow down to 25. I mean, if you have to get inflation to 2%, given where we are now, yeah. and that crazy strong inflation figure from France and Spain this week, I mean, you cut aggressively now, and maybe you have peak terminal rates in September, 
and then you kind of slow down. Does that make sense? I mean, philosophically, is it the right way to do? Like, just hike no matter what comes, and then you pause and think. Well, the ECB, we, we, has, we saw in the minutes yesterday released by the ECB that there's clearly a preference for front loading. So get that hike, get that, those large hikes out there first instead of kind of taking a long gradual approach. So in all likelihood by September, um, the, the hiking cycle will have come to an end and the government of the Banque de France has already indicated that they want this all to be over by then. Um, and the economy will probably have weakened um, uh, significantly more by then, so there will be less yeah. need um, by the time we pass the summer for more hikes. So likely more soon, more hikes sooner, yeah. and, then, uh, and, then, and then a pause. Yeah, and we're speaking yesterday to the uh, chair of Société Générale, and he's saying, look, the, the problem is that there's always a 12 to 18 month lag on the impact of monetary, monetary policy readjustment. So what, how do you see this developing, Zoe? Yeah, that's exactly the problem. The issue is, just as a reminder, the ECB is not trying to slow inflation right now. What they're trying to do is make sure that inflation expectations um, get brought down so that we don't have a, the danger of a wage price spiral here, that people think, OK, inflation is going to stay high for very long. So that longer end is the whole element here. Um, again, um, now, if we're doing our math, we've got two, we are at, um, t um, the deposit rate is at 2.5% um, right now. We get another 50 this month, so that'll be three. Then in May, another 50, that already takes us to four. And then if we think that, um, as David just mentioned, that there'll be hikes in June, July, and maybe even September, yeah. that does take us clearly a before, which is almost scary. I mean, it is quite scary. I mean, it's certainly yeah. like a huge shift where we haven't seen zombie companies, we haven't really seen anything ugly hit the economy. Is there then talk about a potential cut into next year? Or, or is this just a conversation that we're going to have in the summer? Philip Lane, has, who's the chief economist, said that he that once they reach, reach peak, it could be there at some time. Yeah. If I remember correctly, markets right now are thinking that it, the, the peak will stay there, for, that they'll stay at that peak for quite a while. I think the ECB is still burnt a bit from 2011 when they hiked and then were forced to cut in the same year. That's just when Draghi took over. And they, I don't think the ECB would like to see us flip-flopping. Yeah, is this a concern about just overall central bank credibility that they need to calibrate it so that they don't over tighten because cutting straight after is just not a good move? Well, they are certainly at risk of over, t of, of, of over tightening. You know, if you look at central banking in the run up to this big jump in inflation, uh, most of the messaging was clearly anchored in what will, what, uh, what will happen two years down the road, kind of what, what their forecasts were. Whereas now central banking is reacting to present inflation readings um, and, and, and that um, doesn't take into account the lag you mentioned um, for monetary policy. So we really are not going to see a big impact for kind of 12 to 18 months. Um, and at that stage, it may be quite obvious that they've done too much. Okay. I, and, and they're fearful, right, of not doing too much. So um, what yeah. kind of conversation? I mean, first yes. of all, the governing council is, not, is also not on page. Yeah, um, so overall, the, um, because they know that core, um, that, sorry, headline inflation numbers yeah. are going to be slowing, the hawks have quite clearly shifted to say we need to watch core inflation. And if you look at this week, we know headline inflation um, on the euro area just fell, it just slowed very little bit, just from 8.6 to 8.5. Yeah. Um, core inflation, that strips out. Um, food and energy, that jumped to yet a new record of 5.6%. And there is, um, all, yeah, you, if you look at the models, it looks like at some point now, um, core inflation will stay ho ho high, will be higher than headline inflation. And David already me mentioned yesterday's minutes. The, the minutes showed and, uh, that some policymakers warned that there was too much of a focus on core. But if you look at all the speeches right now, everyone's saying core inflation, core inflation, core inflation. We need to bring that down. And core inflation probably won't peak until the second quarter. I believe, David, that's your forecast as well. Okay, thank you both for joining us. David Powell there from our research arm and, of course, our economics queen who oversees all of our ECB coverage, Zoe Schneeweiss. Coming up, China's National People's Congress kicks off this Sunday. We'll discuss the political and economic implications next. And this is Book.
An expected overhaul of China's financial regulatory regime would likely put more decision-making of key economic policies in fewer hands and centralize it under Xi Jinping. And unlike in past policymaker lineups, academic or international credentials won't necessarily be preferred. He Li Feng, a close confidant of Xi, will likely be central to this reshuffle. He's expected to be named party chief of the People's Bank of China, as well as successor to Vice Premier Liu He as Xi's economic czar. The last vice premier who also took a top PBOC position was Zhu Rongji, whose tough reform style as PBOC governor in the mid-90s helped combat high inflation. The next PBOC governor could be Zhu He Xin, a veteran banker and most recently the chairman of state-owned financial conglomerate Citic Group. Under his watch, Citic played a major role in rescuing China's troubled debt manager Hua Rong. Unlike current governor Yi Gong and party chief Guo Shuqing, neither He nor Zhu have reputations as academics or economic theorists. But analysts feel the reported leadership moves to install a party official and a veteran banker to key central bank positions could actually usher in more pragmatic and less hawkish policy. Stephen Engel, Bloomberg News. And staying with China, in a rare briefing, PBOC Governor Yi Gang reiterated the central bank's prudent monetary policy approach, saying that currency volatility was not a concern. Now let's get straight to Rebecca Chen Wilkins, our Asia government and politics correspondent in Hong Kong with the very latest. Rebecca, what were your key takeaways from the briefing? Well, we really saw that China and the PBOC are essentially happy with how monetary policy is currently being rolled out. The sort of key phrase here was to keep monetary policy purposeful, targeted and forceful. And ensuring stability is really central here. It's unlikely we see much stimulus. We know that authorities are sort of reported to be uh, surprisingly happy with the growth numbers that we've seen so far. So focus is really going to be on sustaining inflation at the level it is uh, and continuing to use existing tools like uh, the triple R to manage liquidity. Rebecca, what can we expect from the National People's Congress starting on Sunday? So they'll remove better known economists for more party loyals. If they know government so well, if they have the support of President Xi so much, can they actually get more things done? Yes, indeed. That's the hope, um, that they will sort of be effective policymakers here. But really, for Xi Jinping, the name of the game is going to be stability. It's all about um, ensuring and restoring stability and calm, not just the financial system and the economy, but also to you know, restore some of this dented credibility that Xi faces after you know, we've seen sporadic protests and social unrest in response to the management um, of policymakers to COVID. There are a couple of key items to really look out for. Growth is one of them, of course. Um, given the stronger numbers, we may see something more optimistic than a 5% target. Could be something around 6%. Stimulus, as I say, not expecting something massive. And again, we're going to see this restructuring of these key financial institutions who are at the heart of restoring growth. Rebecca, thanks so much. Uh, Rebecca Chung Wilkins. We'll have plenty more, of course, throughout the day on China and also look ahead to Lufthansa, the chief executive coming on later. This is Bloomberg. We're in un unprecedented times in terms of the volatility of the economic data. We're certainly all beholden to the data at this point. 2023 is also the story of, you know, headwinds from 22 turning into tailwinds. This is a really unusual set of circumstances. Yes. Inflation expectations have gone up dramatically over the last 30 to 45 days. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards and Matt Miller. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 6 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. Interest rates may end up higher than expected. Central bankers in the U.S. and Europe warn they'll have to go further if inflation stays strong. The Adani Empire gets a lifeline. Shares of the Indian billionaires in battled companies jump after an investor makes a $1.9 billion bet on them. And Lufthansa sees crowded skies and bigger profits. The German carrier joins its peers in forecasting a travel rebound. 
this year. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. And Matt, it strikes me we're still very much in a post-pandemic uh, period, still suffering the legacy of the pandemic in some areas, in the labour markets, which remain tight in many parts of the world. And Lufthansa taking off because of all that revenge tourism still happening. Yeah, I mean, my A2 here on set is still wearing a mask what are we, uh, three years <laughs> on now? But let's take a look at what's going on in stocks right now because it's really about, I think, uh, an ebbing of interest rates today that's driving futures higher. Uh, maybe not driving futures higher, but holding them up a little bit, only up two-tenths of 1%. And the 10-year yield um, continues to come down. That's the tailwind right now off five or six basis points to just about four even. If you want to go out, what's this, five significant digits Wow, I've never seen us go out five significant digits, but we did it. 4.0008 right now on the 10-year yield. Yesterday was pretty amazing because we saw the entire curve up above uh, 4%. Now we're down below on the 10-year yield. So we continue to come down there, and that's a bigger tailwind for stocks. You can see futures rising a little bit uh, on that. NYMEX crude is down just 14 cents, but still a 78 handle on a barrel of West Texas Intermediate. That's as expectations for the pickup in China post-COVID uh, zero policy continue. And then Bitcoin. After uh, Silvergate, and we'll talk about that stock, continues to fall today. Um, Bitcoin falls further. Now under 23,000 at 22,376. And a uh, um, in terms of what we see in Asia, you mentioned the Adani story, and I want to bring uh, viewers uh, and listeners' attention to this. Up 17% Adani Enterprises after a big Indian investor makes a $1.9 billion bet. Timing couldn't be better, it seems, or maybe um, this is the, the uh, cart following the horse. Um, but we'll talk about that throughout the program as well. In terms of the broader market in Asia, up more than 1%. The Nikkei had pretty decent gains in Tokyo, up 1.5%. And the dollar gets a little bit weaker against the yen. Actually, the Bloomberg dollar index coming down uh, a little bit, so weaker against most of its major trading partners. But you can buy 136.18 yen for your dollar right now. What do you see going on in Europe? Yeah, well, uh, something in Asia, uh, certainly ending the week strong. Maybe it's that data looking back to the middle of the week when we got data out of China that seemed to uh, push risk assets a little bit higher. Maybe that's still having a legacy impact on Europe as well. We see markets moving a little bit higher, despite the fact that when we started trading, we had U.S. futures in negative territory, but they seem to have come back to the flat line, slightly positive. European stocks then making up for uh, what they missed out on yesterday and catching up with Wall Street just a little bit. So we're stronger across European markets. Most sectors are in positive territory, apart from media. We'll come to that in a moment. The pound, I put in the pound, I could have put in the euro. We see a lot of dollar weakness and strength in other currencies. Perhaps that's adding to appetite for risk assets today. So the pound at 119.84. This is the auto sector. Interesting to watch developments politically in Europe. Europe has had to put on hold or postpone a vote that was supposed to take place next week on Tuesday, a vote on the future of the internal combustion engine. Uh, so that's been put on hold. And as a result, we see uh, a, a lot of questions being asked about whether European policy goes on the auto space. Germany had fit. There were fears that Germany might have abstained, basically, which is why they postponed that. Universal Music Group, this is what's weighing on the media stocks here in Europe today. And it's interesting because the numbers themselves, thanks, of course, to a new album from Taylor Swift. I say, of course, but I read that in the story. Uh, Universal Music Group uh, beat estimates, but there are concerns about com uh, stock-based compensation for employees, also concerns around FX, and that appears to be weighing on the stock today. And here's the natural gas price, Matt, and I put this in here because, for a couple of reasons, this is the European benchmark. We're down a little but 45 euros is much less than 320 and that's the kind of level we got to when we saw the spike at the height of the invasion of, or the early days of the invasion of Ukraine so that's worth thinking about we are heading towards some colder weather though uh, which is also something to think about we are many times over the average price in 2020 though also worth considering where we could fall to also, another reason to include this is that here in the UK, we've just heard, uh, well, at least media in the UK, newspapers in the UK, uh, The Times, reporting that Chancellor Hunt is poised to extend the energy price guarantee. That is basically support for households on their energy bills. Matt? There's a new Taylor Swift album? Apparently so, and it helped Universal Music Group, but that was offset by You Nexus. know, there was a time when that would have resulted in, you know, tweets from Joe Weisenthal, an opinion column from John Authors, a cover story <laughs> at Business Week, but now we just know it by now reading... Now it's left to you and I. Yeah, a story on Universal Music Group. All right, got to check that out. Um, two Fed policymakers are warning the central bank may need to lift interest rates to a, a higher peak. 
Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic says he's open to raising rates higher than he had envisioned if the economy remains robust, repeating basically what the Fed's been saying for well over a year now. He's data dependent. Bloomberg's Valerie Titel joins us for more. Valerie, Fed Governor Chris Waller's speech, that was rudely interrupted uh, uh, by, I guess, an adult video and a Zoom call. But what did he tell us in his text? We got the text before he canceled his speech. Yes, thankfully the text was released on the internet for all of us to see. Uh, he emphasized really that the, there's still a lot of key data to, to see in between now and then when the Fed convenes again at the end of March. But this is the key phrase for me. He needs to see CPI pull back significantly, else the terminal rate is going to head higher. He used this word significantly. And even if we look at what economists have penciled in for the next CPI print, it is not, it is definitely not forecast to have a significant pullback. So that was a clear hawkish signal from the Fed's Waller. The front end didn't really sell off in this. I found that surprising. It goes without saying the front end has done a lot of work recently. We have priced in a lot of Fed hikes. Maybe it's time finally for a breather. Mm, maybe it is. And what about the European story then here, Valerie? Over to Europe, the ECB's Wunsch told us that 4% terminal rate, that that is possible. The street has been revising its ECB calls higher for the last, uh, what, days, weeks. What's the latest? Yeah, strategists were very busy yesterday revising their calls after the uh, hot, and, uh, hot core inflation print we got yesterday. Barclays, kind of known as a dovish, a dovish, uh, a dovish, a dovish bank uh, on their ECB calls revised up to 4%, uh, going for a 50 basis point hike in May. That's following another jumbo hike here at the next meeting in March. Morgan Stanley and BMP both revising up their calls as well to, to that 4% nice round number. But I also want to focus on something that Schnabel said in her speech yesterday. She she had a speech. It was focused very much on QT. It gave a lot of details on her thinking there. She said the large stock of assets that they have currently on their balance sheet may undermine their inflation fight and that a balance sheet the balance sheet is too big than what's needed for their policy stance. It's comments like this on QT combined with the fact that we're getting all these hot inflation prints. Perhaps the pressure is going to amp up for the ECB to ramp up their QT pace. Remember, Anna, they just started QT a few days ago, and it's only at a 15 billion per month pace. I wouldn't be surprised if they amp it up. Right. It would take 30 years, apparently, for them to pay it off if they wanted to get rid of the balance sheet. They're still at nine trillion, right? The Fed. Meanwhile, coming in just under $8 trillion. Valerie Titel, thanks very much for that. Now, one of the biggest names in emerging, market in, in, in emerging markets investing put a, a $1.9 billion bet on Gal Tamadani's empire, sending the group's stock soaring. The move by GQG marks the most significant show of support from a major money manager since the short seller uh, report from Hindenburg locked $153 billion off the Indian conglomerate's market value. Bloomberg's PR Sanjay joins us now from Mumbai for more. So, PR, um, tell us about this investor. Tell us about the logic behind the bet. So, yesterday it was a very sur uh, surprising uh, fact for investors that uh, a GQG, a boutique uh, investment firm, coming and in, investing in uh, $1.87 billion to be precise. And they have invested in, uh, in stocks like very key stocks like Adani Ports, Adani Transmission, Adani Green Energy Limited, and the flagship company Adani Enterprises itself. And, uh, you know, the logic behind uh, this investment, what uh, according to uh, GQG's uh, Rajiv Jain, is that uh, the, he's betting on uh, the, the quality of assets. So he's like, for instance, he's uh, you know drawing a parallel to Adani Ports when you know in the, the peer group in US are all having negative cash uh, returns. In this case, uh, Adani Ports, which commands around 30% per market share in India, is still having strong cash flows. So he's betting huge on cash flows and quality of assets. In the same same goes with Adani Green Energy and Adani Transmission as well. So he believes firmly in the story, and that's why. He says that when people are really fearful, uh, it is not. Uh, uh, you, you can be greedy. That's that's the logic uh, goes behind this uh, investment, according to Rajiv Jain. Okay, so that's that's his logic. That's why he is his uh, a fan of the companies, and you can see that the impact uh, this is having on stocks trading today. Then uh, is this going to be something that helps Adani turn a corner? 
No, I don't think uh, this is the only thing. You know, they, they have to line up more funds because there are more repayments. Things are coming, and uh, today, as we speak, there is a investor roadshow happening at the headquarters of Ahmedabad of uh, Adani Enterprises Limited. And uh, we, what we pick up is there is going to be more roadshows for fix, uh, fixed income uh, investors, which will begin from uh, Middle East to UK to US, and which will conclude on March 14th. So they will they will have to give a lot more reassurances to the investors in coming days. All right, PR, thanks very much, Bloomberg's PR Sanjay reporting from Mumbai, Mumbai on this big move back up in Adani stocks on a $1.9 billion bet. Now, Deutsche Lufthansa has joined other major European airlines in predicting a travel rebound this year. The German flagship carrier expects a significant improvement in the $1.6 billion in earnings it reported for 2022. Let's get more on this with Bloomberg's Oliver Crook, who's at the company's aviation center in Frankfurt. Ali, uh, the shares blazing higher on earnings, busy 24 hours for Lufthansa. We're hearing more and more about uh, M&A. Take us through the numbers. That's right, Matt. So you had a very busy 24 hours. And the quote probably of the day for the CEO who is speaking right behind me there giving a press conference is, Lufthansa is back. And that's certainly the sentiment among investors this morning. EBITDA in at $1.5 billion. But there are a couple footnotes attached to this. If you strip out cargo, which has been the kind of savior throughout the pandemic, this is an airline that still lost money on passenger traffic. So a lot of this uh, upward momentum in the stock has to do on the outlook and where they see demand coming back. They predict 85% to 90% of pre-COVID capacity city coming back um, into uh, into uh, action in 2023. We also had overnight the uh, CEO's tenure being extended by another five years to, to 2028. And then the other thing, 22 new aircraft, wide bodies, big planes, 17 from Airbus or 15 from Airbus, seven from Boeing. So this is all fairly bullish in terms of the outlook. But again, a couple footnotes attached to that. OK, so a big turnaround then for this business. What does the flight path ahead look like, Ollie? Uh, Matt was referencing M&A, and I know the CEO has talked about the possibility of that. OK, Oliver, I don't know if you heard Anna, um, but she was asking about the M&A headlines that we saw across the terminal. What do we know? I don't think I don't think Oliver I don't think Oliver hears us at all, Frank. No. Bloomberg's no. Oliver Crook there. <laughs> uh, maybe uh, our questions drowned out by a 787 Dreamliner. Let's take a look at some of the stocks that we're watching in the pre-market trade today. Um, there are a lot of individual movers. I don't know why, but I picked uh, most of them that go to the downside. Zscaler is one of them. You can see it's down more than 12% right now um, after deferred revenue missed the average analyst estimate. It's weird because they killed it on adjusted EPS and on overall revenue, up 52% year over year. But they missed just slightly on deferred revenue, which itself was up 46%. The outlook smacked, too. They had EPS uh, 152 to 153 this year. They had seen 123 to 125, and analysts were only looking for 154. So go figure on that. Marvel Technologies, which makes semiconductors not superheroes, forecasts adjusted gross margin for the first <laughs> quarter of about 60%. Analysts were looking for 64%. So that stock is down 9%, almost decimated in the pre-market. And then Dell fell after delivering a disappointing outlook, stoking fears of a prolonged downturn in demand for computers and office equipment. Revenue will decrease 19% sequentially in the first quarter, the fiscal force quarter, which ends in May, according to the CFO Tom Sweet. Sweet added that infrastructure, which had led growth in recent quarters for Dell Technologies, will be down more than 20%. So big drop there uh, in the forecast and the shares off three and three quarters percent in the pre-market. Anna? Well, coming up in the program then, Matt, we will talk to Gertrude Gill, macro strategist for fixed income at Goldman Sachs Asset Management. We'll get her perspective on the latest headlines coming through from the Fed. Raphael Bostic, was it really dovish? Does it stand in contrast to other more hawkish messages? Uh, we will see how the market is, is receiving Fed messaging right now. And US President Joe Biden and Chancellor of Germany Olaf Scholz are meeting at the White House today. We will speak with Suda David Wilp, director of GMF Berlin office. We'll get to that conversation. Plus, China kicks off. It's National People's Congress over the weekend. It's the annual parliamentary gathering. It begins in Beijing on Sunday. We've got a preview as the country faces its biggest reshuffle in leadership in decades. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. I'm Matt Miller here in New York. Anna Edwards with us out of London. Now, um, the recession fears seem to have cooled from the end of 2022, the beginning of 2023. Nonetheless, Moody's uh, forecast default rates that I'm surprised by. The severely pessimistic um, obviously is very bad. That uh, scenario is a 16% default rate. But moderately pessimistic is still 10.4%. That's huge. I mean, at the beginning of the year, Matthew Mish from UBS was saying 9%. And a lot of people were like, ugh, that's a little bit too much. The baseline is for 4.6% and optimistic is for 4%. So these default rates, I think, are really interesting considering uh, the mood music around the possibility of a default moving, I mean, of a recession moving from 2023 now to 2024 for a lot of people. Joining us to talk more about this is Irene Garcia Perez, Bloomberg debt reporter. Um, uh, I hope I did justice on that name, Irene. What are you hearing about the possibility of defaults as we see some really big names? I mean, I can't even believe they're allowed to default, like Black uh, Blackstone and PIMCO and other huge players that have the money but just choose not to honor contractual obligations. Yes, yeah, so indeed, we're seeing an increase on, on defaults across the board. The, the ones that you just mentioned um, are in real estate, which has is facing uh, problems of its own because of higher interest rates. Um, but we are also seeing players struggling in other places like, like retail. And the important thing to take into account is that those default figures are for the names that Moody's rates, so are bigger capital structures. The actual numbers of insolvencies and defaults are worse because there are a lot of smaller companies that don't have access to capital markets or um, other options that are going to struggle to repay. Mm. It's really interesting, isn't it, Irene? Because you would think something doesn't add up in terms of the macro data we're getting at the moment. If you've got default rates that are, are, are going higher, and yet you don't really see cracks, cracks in labor markets. You know, you would expect that if businesses are going under, then people are going to be uh, laid off, and maybe those three things not tying together. Um, uh, tell us more about what's going on in the retail space, then. You say that they're, uh, they're the owner of some big gallery, uh, some big uh, uh, shopping centers. That's where we're seeing pressure. The Blackstone story relates to Finnish um, uh, office space. It seems quite broad. It is. It is indeed broad. And it, um, it, it has to do with uh, inflation, companies not being able to pass through all the costs. It has to do with higher interest rates. And um, altogether, it has like weaker consumer confidence. And it also has to do with uh, refinancing risk. In real estate and CMBS, in particular, commercial um, mortgage-backed uh, securities, the refinancing risk is very, very high, and there are a lot of names that have to refinance between this year and next year, and that's where we're going to, we are expecting to see a lot of defaults because these companies won't be able to lock in um, these uh, refinancings at a price that is uh, appealing for them. Hey, Rene, thank you very much. Rene Garcia Perez uh, with the latest on uh, a host of uh, stories, really, from uh, tracking default rates across the globe. And for more market analysis, check out MLIV Go, the function to use on your Bloomberg terminal. This is Bloomberg. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. In Hong Kong, fire raced through a 42-story hotel being built near the waterfront. It took hours to put it uh, under control. There were no casualties. The Kimtum Hong Kong is a 490, well, was a 492-room luxury hotel that will be operated by Intercontinental Hotels Group when they get finished uh, rebuilding it. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken pressed his Russian counterpart to end the war in Ukraine. Blinken and Sergei Lavrov had a brief and unexpected encounter during the Group of 20 meeting in India. It was their first encounter since the war began a year ago. A Russian spokeswoman says that Blinken said nothing interesting. Citigroup is cutting hundreds of jobs across the country. The investment bank and mortgage underwriting uh, are among the sectors affected. Bloomberg's learned the cuts amount to less than 1% of Citi's 240,000 person workforce. The reductions are said to be part of the bank's routine business planning. And as you can imagine, there aren't as many uh, mortgages being sold in this environment. 
In the UK, the market regulator is investigating the London Metals Exchange. The issue is how the LME handled a massive short squeeze in the nickel market last year. You may recall nickel prices spiked 250 percent in a little more than 24 hours in March. The LME, sus LME suspended the market for a week and canceled billions of dollars of trades at the highest prices. Coming in, Gurpreet Gill, macro strategist for fixed income at Goldman Sachs. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Interest rates may end up higher than expected. Central bankers in the U.S. and Europe warn they'll have to go further if inflation stays strong. The Adani Empire gets a lifeline. Shares of the Indian billionaires in battle companies jump after an investor makes a $1.9 billion bet on them. And Lufthansa sees crowded skies and bigger profits. The German carrier joins its peers in forecasting a travel rebound this year. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. A little earlier, we got very mixed set of data on the services PMI side. I know you're working towards some uh, data out uh, of a similar nature in the US a little bit later on, Matt. But futures have turned around from earlier weakness. Now, pointing higher. Yeah, we are seeing futures gain, um, not huge gains, but about a quarter percent up on the S&P mini contracts. And I think part of that is a tailwind coming from a slight reduction in rates. Yesterday, we saw the U.S., uh, well, rates across the curve in the U.S. jump above 4%. Um, at, at the two-year inching ever closer to 5%, right? But the 10-year right now um, holding just above 4 at 4 spot 0027, down 5 and a third basis points. That's a tailwind for stocks, and uh, you, that's why we get this slight gain. There are other reasons for slight gains uh, in stocks. You have crude coming down a little, 77.87, so we were looking at a 78 hand. Now we're off just 29 cents, but enough to bring us below that level. And Brent, I believe, is down as well. Um, the dollar is also lower against a lot of major currencies and against the uh, digital currency, if you will, commodity if you prefer. Bitcoin right now under 23,000, firmly at 22,374, uh, 22,375. Let's take a look at some of the losers in today's market, though, or at least in the pre-market. Um, Zscaler is a big one right now, down more than 12% after reporting second quarter deferred revenue that missed slightly. Um, the overall revenue was great, the EPS was great, and the outlook was great. But deferred revenue was down a little bit, and they all of a sudden uh, lose 12% of their value. Marvel Technologies, or Marvel uh, Technology, which makes semiconductors, as I said before, not, uh, the, uh, not the comic strip company, um, down 8% after it came out with a, a gross margin of 60%. Analysts were looking for 64 So that's a big miss in gross margin terms in the chip industry, and as a result, the company is being duly punished by the market. And then finally, Dell Technologies down three and three quarters percent after delivering a pretty disappointing outlook, stroking fears of a continued downturn in demand for PCs and office equipment. Revenue is going to fall about 19 percent in the first quarter um, from the previous fiscal fourth quarter, this according to the CFO Tom Sweet, he added that infrastructure, which has been a big part of the growth story in recent quarters, is going to be down more than 20 percent. Um, so that's a disappointment for investors, and they're pricing it in to the stock this morning. What do you see in Europe, Anna? Yeah, we see resilience here in Europe. They're Matt, six tenths of a percent higher for the uh, stocks to Europe 600. And to your point about the slight weakness that was slight re retreat we've seen in rates, maybe they, that, that is at the margin having an impact. Also, some of the dollar moves and the strength we're seeing in European currencies, maybe that's also having an impact, even if the, 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 uh, the bigger picture journey has been to higher rates, as we've talked about many times. Uh, stock 600 auto sector up by 1.3 percent. Away from the stock market move itself, an interesting one to watch is what the European legislative a backdrop looks like for the auto space. So it seems that Europe has had to delay a decision that was due to be, uh, to be a kind of procedural decision. It was expected to be on Tuesday. But now there were fears around the future of the combustion engine. And now there are fears that Germany would abstain. And so as a result, they've delayed that, that conversation and that decision. Universal Music Group, here's the Taylor Swift story uh, once again for you. Even Taylor Swift's new album cannot uh, support the stock today, even if it was one of the things that led to the company beating estimates in their quarterly numbers that they just reported. But analysts seem to be more concerned about 
FX and uh, equity compensation for staff. And so as a result, the stock is down by 3.4%. Uh, the natural gas price here in Europe, I thought we should just keep checking this because it was such a big story through the winter. 45 euros a megawatt hour is where we trade, way less than the 320, which is where we got to at the height of the panic, really, around European gas prices. So, you know, extremely impressive the way that those prices have come down. But they are still elevated versus history, still many times what you would normally be paying uh, back to 2020 and early 2021 data, Matt. Right. Well, and if you look out at what people are paying for uh, contracts next winter, they're still pretty elevated, right? Yeah, they are. Although I was speaking to a guest recently from Traffic Era who was saying you have to make some really gloomy, because of where storage is after this winter, you actually have to make some really gloomy forecasts for where the Eurozone goes to actually see a big struggle next winter, which is sort of the, uh, the glass half full interpretation of what we're seeing here. Well, that's good news indeed. All right. Uh, let's talk about some of the macro issues we're watching in uh, these markets with Gurpreet Gill right now. Macro strategist for fixed income at Goldman Sachs Asset Management. And Gurpreet, I guess uh, rates still have to be the story after this amazing rise that we saw yesterday here across the curve in the U.S. We're above 4%, um, or at least we were yesterday. We're bouncing around that level right now, um, but almost five on the two-year. Do you think that, uh, that this is the peak, or can we continue to go higher? Hi, Matt. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on the show, and good morning. Um, I would say that big picture, taking a step back, we've gone over the past four weeks for the markets being concerned about recession risk, but also expecting disinflation to a return to being concerned about the economy possibly overheating. And so there are shades of 2022 in the hawkish price action that you just alluded to, but there are differences in that the hawkish repricing is also driven by an improving growth outlook. In terms of the rate markets, I would note that there is risk of further hawkish price action from here. And that is because although the market has moved to no longer anticipate rate cuts in 2023, it's still anticipating policy easing next year. So there's a risk that that could be priced out. We've got key data coming up. We've got the payrolls next week, CPI mid-March, Powell speaking next week. But I would also caution that we need to mind the data. We need to stay data dependent. A lot of the uptick that we saw in the mm. upside price for inflation was driven by seasonal factors. And so data is subject to revisions and we can't conclude the outlook on one month's data alone. Right. Well, I mean, and of course, the Fed's been telling us forever um, that it is data dependent. Raphael Bostic, the most recent to say, hey, you know what? I could move uh, higher in my um, in my uh, terminal rate forecast if the data demands, which is like, no duh, right? Um, but you're adding 25 basis points to your terminal rate forecast as well, aren't you? Yes, we have. Look, in, in light of that flurry of February data that we saw at the beginning of the month, we saw the economy in the U.S. add more than double the amount of jobs anticipated, over half a million. The unemployment rate is at its lowest level since 1969. We saw the sharpest uptick in the ISM services index since last June. And then, as I mentioned, PC and CPI inflation. Also, we had that disinflation trend in, in those readings be interrupted. And so all of that has led us to expect one more 25 basis points rate hike than we previously envisaged for a terminal rate of 5.5% and 5.25 to 5.5%. But a lot can change between now and May. We're going to have to remain humble and nimble. And I wouldn't em emphasize that big picture. The areas of the market that we saw value entering 2023, we still think they are attractive. It's still attractive to be investing in investment grade credit. The income credentials are still there. Mm. It's still attractive to be investing in green bonds. OK, Gurpreet, I wonder how concerned you are about real estate markets, and if so, uh, what kind of real estate markets? We were covering a story earlier about Blackstone defaulting on some Nordic uh, CMBS, so commercial uh, mortgage-backed securities, and I know that you've moderated an overweight exposure to agency MBS, mortgage-backed securities. What are you thinking about when it comes to the higher-rate environment and parts of the real estate sector? Well, first of all, I would say that the housing market is one of the most rate sensitive segments of the economy, and that is where you see the impact of tighter policy first. Um, but there are regional differences 
the UK housing market we think is much more sensitive given the shorter duration of mortgage contracts. So you're going to see that impact of tighter policy feed through quicker here than, say, in the United States. And that's one of the reasons why um, we anticipate the Bank of England's heightened cycle concluding this month. But I would say, big picture, the, the view on moderating our overweight exposure to US agency mortgage-backed securities was driven by a change in our initial thesis. And so we anticipate an uptick in new supply. So we're mindful of that technical headwind. And we actually moderated that exposure at attractive levels. But more broadly, we do think fundamentals remained robust. OK, fundamentals remain robust, so not too much concern there. On to Europe and your expectations for the Eurozone. And we've talked about the Fed and what you expect to be the terminal rate there, uh, Gerpreet. Uh, what do you expect to see in terms of heights in March and May? Uh, it seems that many people expecting March. May was a real topic of conversation in the, the uh, recent Eurozone uh, ECB sorry, minutes. Yeah, that's a great point. We've also actually added a hike to our... ECB outlook. So we anticipate 250 basis points rate hikes in March and in May, and then a 25 basis points rate hike in the summer for a terminal rate of three and three quarters percent in Europe. That is driven by firmness in underlying inflation. We saw that in this week's flash inflation data. Services momentum is positive. We've also seen hawkish commentary from ECB officials. We had Isabel Schnabel highlighting that the longer duration nature of wage contracts in Europe, as well as collective bargaining, all points to more persistent wage pressures in Europe relative to the US. And so I would say in, in Europe, we think risks are skewed towards the upside in terms of hawkish risks. And that would lead us to be biased to be underweight European rates on a cross market basis at this juncture. juncture. But again, have to remain data dependent. There's a lot between now mm. and when we expect that hiking cycle to conclude. Another interesting point is that Villeroy at the ECB emphasized that the hiking cycle will conclude at the end of summer, and he made an effort to yes. clarify that the end of summer is September. OK, yes, you never can be sure these days. Gerpreet, thanks very much. Gerpreet Gill of Goldman Sachs Asset Management, thank you for joining us and providing your views on fixed income markets. Coming up, we'll be back to the geopolitics. Olaf Scholz goes to Washington. The German Chancellor is set to meet with President Biden at the White House later on today. What can we expect? This is Big Bang. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, an interview with the New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy. That conversation at 12 p.m. in New York, 5 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Germany's Chancellor Olaf Scholz may be put on the defensive today when he meets at the White House with President Biden. Scholz could come under pressure over the struggle to produce enough ammunition for Ukraine. The two leaders are likely to discuss ways to step up manufacturing. Joining us now is Suda David Wilp, director of GMF's Berlin office. And Suda... First of all, I can't imagine Olaf Scholz really on the defensive. Um, he's pretty cool, calm, and collected. And uh, President Biden has yet to send over any F-22s, so it's not like the U.S. is doing everything in its power. What do you expect from this meeting? Great to see you, Matt. And yes, Olaf Scholz is certainly unflappable. And I really think this meeting is just um, an opportunity for the two leaders to get together and take stock of where the war against Ukraine is right now, what needs to be done, examine future scenarios, and also think about how um, both leaders can sustain um, momentum, because I do think the electorates on both sides of the Atlantic are showing war weariness. It did seem odd, and I'd love to get your take, um, that Schultz balked for so long at real support for Ukraine, real support for uh, European democracy under attack from the Russians, especially considering, um, you know, Germany looked so bad for, you know, sending so much money to Moscow for so many years. I mean, Angela Merkel basically made a commitment to Vladimir Putin to um, finance pretty much everything he wants to do in order for uh, Germany to be powered by Russian gas. Why didn't Schultz react stronger and more quickly? 
Well, you know, Chancellor Schultz and the SPD was also in power with Angela Merkel for three out of the four terms that she served. So both mainstream parties were um, kind of involved in this whole idea of change through trade with Russia, which didn't work out, of course. And um, I do think that there is a reckoning that's happening in Berlin. And as you know, Matt, um, you know, Germany is, doesn't consider itself as, as a military power. And it's starting to learn quickly to face up to geopolitical realities after last February. And Chancellor Schultz rightly did a very strong speech on the floor of the Bundestag a year ago this week talking about how Germany needs to transform or it's facing a turning point. And there has been lots of transformation, transformation, for example, when it comes to energy and also thinking about relations with Russia and maybe even China. But there has been, it's been very halting, the so-called turning point and wobbly when it comes to military investment. I think um, that words haven't necessarily matched deeds, but now with the new defense minister in the post, I think there are signs that things could be changing and there is a realization um, that Germany needs to do more because this could be a long war that Ukraine faces. And, um, you know, the, the tank um, controversy is one example. Germany is now sending okay. its um, leopard tanks to Ukraine. Yes, uh, red lines uh, uh, being crossed, it seems, or things that were previously red lines uh, managing to be uh, to come through. Uh, but good to see you, Suda. I wanted to ask you about something else that perhaps will be on the agenda between Biden and Schultz, and that could be the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States, support for businesses, support for more energy-efficient businesses. This has been a point of tension, certainly the Europeans pointing to it for some time. Uh, President Joe Biden's chief, uh, trade chief, sorry, Catherine Tai, spoke to our colleague David Weston recently, and, and and clearly, uh, the U.S. is mindful of tensions that have been created here. Let's just have a listen to what she said. We take those concerns very seriously, as you know. Um, we have been intensively uh, consulting with and working with our partners in Europe, uh, including through a task force set up between the White House and uh, President von der Leyen's cabinet. Suda, are they going to find common ground on this? It does seem as if the initial uh, expression of concern from Europe has died down a little. And I think that, you know, the main um, purpose of this meeting is to discuss Ukraine. But, of course, the Inflation Reduction Act will be a topic of conversation and worries about European competitiveness. Um, Germany thinks, um, and as other European allies, that it really is a disadvantage for European industry, the IRA. But there is some nuance among parties here in Berlin. The Greens, for example, are taking it in stride. They think it's great that the United States is, is coupling business goals with climate goals. So, you know, let's see what happens. I think for the most part, Europeans are very, very happy that Biden has shown amazing transatlantic unity. The Germans are also happy that the administration has given Germany sort of a soft touch when it comes to the past year. And it's actually worked. Nord Stream 2 is not a topic anymore. Uh, the Germans are delivering lethal weapons. But China is another sticking point that is probably also going to be a topic of conversation. Germany is very involved with trade with China. And as you know, um, the administration has made signals that China is thinking about delivering weapons to Russia, and that will be difficult for Europeans to square with. Yeah, absolutely. Suda, great to get some time with you. Really appreciate it. Um, thanks for joining us. Suda, David Wilp there, director of GMF's Berlin office. Speaking of China, it's going to hold its annual National People's Congress meeting this Sunday. We're going to tell you what's expected to come out of those conferences next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. Now, China is set to kick off its National People's Congress this Sunday in Beijing. Here's what to expect from this year's meeting with Bloomberg's John Liu. It's time again for the once-a-year full session of China's parliament, the National People's Congress. Thousands of delegates will descend on Beijing to review and approve the country's plans for the coming year. But this won't be the sort of legislative debate that you might see in Washington, D.C. All the plans and targets are formulated well in advance, behind closed doors, and there is no uncertainty about if the NPC will give its blessing. Instead, the reason this event is so closely followed is because it is here that China will unveil its 2023 plans to the world. 
One closely watched detail will be the 2023 growth target. Chinese officials have been debating whether to set that mark at 5%. That would be a substantial acceleration from the 3% that China grew in 2022, and would suggest that Beijing is getting ready to provide more pro-growth policies this year. Also on the spotlight will be China's relationship with the United States and the rest of the world. Newly appointed Foreign Minister Qin Gang will be taking questions from reporters at the MPC. With tensions bubbling over Russia, Taiwan, the balloon, whatever he says will be closely followed. This year's MPC will also mark the end of a five-year term for China's cabinet. So we are ready to get a new premier, new vice premiers, a new finance minister, and a new central bank governor. While Li Qiang, an ally of Chinese President Xi Jinping, is expected to become premier, it's much more of a question who will be put in charge of the finance ministry and the central bank. This is John Liu in Beijing for Bloomberg News. That's what to look ahead to then as the MPC gathers, uh, Matt. So um, important to keep an eye on this always. We had some interesting reporting around the key personnel who are being appointed here. That's always something to watch. I, I noticed that it was social media, big names were kind of out, not necessarily advising the government now. More the chip names. So the tech sector still present at the top table, but from a very different angle. Uh, the growth plans, as uh, John Liu pointed out, clearly a focus, as will be fiscal and uh, other support for the property sector, along with geopolitics. Plenty of that, no doubt. Yeah, um... A lot of people are going to be watching that closely. I'm more likely to be um, paying close attention to what happens when uh, Jerome Powell testifies. We have Humphrey Hawkins next week. Um, so that'll be uh, at least a couple days of testimony. It's mm. always great to hear the questions from our uh, well-educated and informed Congress people and uh, senators. And then we get the blackout period for the Fed. So... We can relax for a little bit after, I think Friday <laughs> Maybe. is the last Maybe. day. of. Fr we will after Friday. no longer have this deluge of Fed speakers. But before that, we do get the deluge, or at least we get a big print, don't we? We get the non-farm payrolls number, the, uh, the jobs report at the end of next week, so that will be a focus. Uh, that's the big data point, really, of the week. But there will be, before that, the China inflation data. And I, I think this is interesting, because there's been a period where we haven't watch so closely what's been going on in the factory gates in China because it hasn't been so relevant to the global story. But now China's reopening from COVID. There does seem to be an increased focus on what that reopening might do to the prices that you and I pay in other economies, Matt. Right. Well, so far it hasn't done very much, though, has it? And I mean, getting backwards data, I don't think is as important as looking at Dr. Copper or the price of oil. And we haven't seen those really pick up after the reopening as much as you may have expected. Yeah, absolutely. We'll keep our eyes on the commodity space for sure. That is it for early edition. Surveillance is ahead. Tom, John and Lisa will be with you. We'll be hearing from PIMCO's Jerome Schneider, among other voices, of course. Uh, this is Bloomberg. <laughs>